Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this one-hour webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our district partners in Los Angeles, Oakland, and Pasadena for their support with this event. I'd also like to let the audience know that this webinar is being recorded. A video recording will be emailed to you in a few days, along with the slides from today. And those slides are also available at the link in the chat box. As people are logging on, I'd like to encourage you to introduce yourself by clicking on the chat button and sharing your name, where you're from, and your position or job title if you'd like to share that. You can find that chat at the bottom of your screen and do please feel free to introduce yourself. And I do see introductions coming in, which is wonderful. It's great to see that we have folks joining us from all across the country, throughout California and other states as well. Welcome to everybody who's joining us. My name is Anna Mayer, and I'm a research analyst and policy advisor at the Learning Policy Institute, where I co-lead the whole child education team. As part of my work on this team, I oversee the California Performance Assessment Collaborative, which I will introduce in just a moment. First, I'd like to share our agenda for our time together. And I'm continuing to see many introductions coming in from across the country with current colleagues and many others as well, and it's wonderful to see you all. Uh, joining the chat. Thank you. Today we'll be sharing some research and practice insights on how district leaders in California have used performance assessments to support student learning. This webinar will provide useful context for educators and policymakers who are interested in implementing or supporting performance assessments. I'm going to start with a brief overview of new research from the Learning Policy Institute which documented the culminating performance assessment initiatives in Los Angeles, Oakland, and Pasadena Unified School Districts. Then I'm going to moderate a discussion with the district leaders who partner with us on this research. Young Wan Choi will represent Oakland Unified in this conversation. Esther Solomon will represent Los Angeles Unified. And Christina Turley will represent Pasadena Unified. We're then going to expand our conversation to address audience questions. As a reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to engage in the discussion, go ahead and click the chat button and type in the chat box at the lower right side of your screen. And I'm continuing to see a lot of introductions coming in from both California and states across the country, which is exciting to see. So before diving into the research, I would like to take a moment to define what we mean by performance assessment. And we're gonna start with a quick poll to see how familiar the audience is with this term. So you should see that poll popping up on your screen. I'll give you a few moments to read and respond. As a reminder, if you select other for your response, please share um, what that means for you in the chat. I'm seeing a lot of responses coming in, which is great. We'll give it just a few more seconds, and then we'll look at the results together. We'll close the poll in just a few seconds. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. So it looks like uh, the majority of our audience has a good understanding of the term performance assessment and of uh, almost uh, somewhere between a quarter, around a quarter, a little more than a quarter, are engaged with directly with implementing performance assessments. Uh, the highest response category was, I have a solid understanding, but I'm not directly engaged. And we also have some folks who've heard of the term, but are not sure exactly how to define it. So that's really helpful context to know as we dive into the presentation and discussion. Thank you, everybody. So, at the Learning Policy Institute, we define performance assessment as a strategy 
uh, that can require students to show what they know by performing, creating, or producing something with real-world applications. High-quality performance assessments are designed to surface students' facility with core modes of inquiry into disciplines. This can include scientific investigation, mathematical modeling, literary analysis, social scientific inquiry, and artistic performance. Performance assessments can be thought of as existing along a continuum of complexity with different types of performance assessments serving different purposes. On one end of the continuum are short-term performance tasks, such as composing a few sentences in an open-ended short response or developing a thorough analysis in an essay. These tasks enable students to demonstrate applied skills in a way that can be useful for comparable reporting and accountability purposes, as well as for diagnostic purposes. At the other end of the continuum are longer, deeper investigations, such as culminating portfolios of student work and graduate capstone projects that are the focus of the research I'm presenting today. These performance assessments require students to design, conduct, analyze, revise, present, and reflect on their work. They can inform classroom instruction and enable students to demonstrate readiness for college and career. And these types of performance assessments are examples of assessments of learning and also of assessments for learning and assessing what students know, also enabling them to, to do more, and assessments as learning, which is the process itself is a learning experience. The California Performance Assessment Collaborative, or CPAC for short, is a statewide network of districts and school networks seeking to expand the use of high quality and equitable performance assessment as a means of driving teaching and learning. You can see the link to our site in the chat. Since 2015, CPAC participants have come together regularly to exchange ideas and resources about how to implement performance assessment systems with the goal of influencing K-12 and higher education policy. We currently have membership throughout California consisting of six school networks and 17 school districts, which represents hundreds of schools and thousands of students in our state. Through CPAC, the Learning Policy Institute has developed a research practice partnership that has enabled us to conduct in-depth case study research on the culminating performance assessment initiatives in three participating districts, Los Angeles, Oakland, and Pasadena. This newly launched research series, which you see pictured here, features a full report and a brief with our cross-district analysis, as well as individual case study reports for each district. Our research included interviews with district administrators and principals, teacher and student focus groups, observations of teacher professional learning sessions and student presentations, and review of administrative documents. We collected data from three school sites in each district. I do want to emphasize that this study documented the implementation of these performance assessment initiatives. It was not an impact evaluation. However, as you'll hear in just a moment, we did collect preliminary self-reported outcome data from students and teachers at a few schools in each district. I'll start with a high-level overview of the district performance assessment initiatives that we studied. Los Angeles Unified is a district with roughly 600,000 students, the second largest in the country, and has implemented performance assessments through linked learning, which is a program of study that integrates a college preparatory curriculum with career and technical education and student support. And linked learning pathways are organized around industry themes such as biomedical, biomedical sciences. Students in linked learning pathways curate a portfolio of their high school work, which they reflect on and present in the 12th grade defense of learning. In 2018-19, approximately 4,000 12th grade students participated in this process. Oakland Unified serves a little over 50,000 students and has a graduate capstone in place which is a year-long original research paper and presentation that students complete in 12th grade. The district is also working on incorporating action projects aligned to students' linked learning pathway themes into the graduate capstone. The capstone is an opt-in process that builds on a 2005 district-wide senior project graduation requirement. In 2018-19, 
Oakland teachers assessed over 1,000 seniors using common graduate capstone rubrics, while other Oakland seniors completed a senior project defined by their school. Pasadena Unified served just over 17,000 students and passed a district-wide graduation policy requiring all 12th grade students, starting with the class of 2019, to collect and reflect on a portfolio of their high school work, including a research paper, which they present in a senior defense. The Pasadena School Board approved this policy in 2014 as part of an effort to revise the district graduate profile. In 2018-19, all 1,067 graduating seniors in Pasadena completed a senior defense. As part of our research, we asked, what are the conditions that need to be in place at the classroom, school, and district levels in order to implement high quality performance assessment? So first, what conditions matter for districts? We found that having foundational policies and practices in place to support the performance assessment initiative, such as board-approved graduation requirements or graduate profiles, as you just heard about in Pasadena and Oakland, as well as structured onboarding processes to join initiatives that require performance assessments, uh, as is the case in Los Angeles Link Learning Pathways, are important for this work. Next, we identified a supportive state and local policy and practice environment and found that this played an important role. In California, this included the, a focus on deeper learning competencies, such as critical thinking and communication in the Common Core State Standards, as well as state and local investments in career and technical education, such as linked learning, that encourage innovative assessments of student learning. Finally, we observed several common key starting conditions across the district. These were access to technical assistance providers, opportunities to observe performance assessments in action, and having a strategy to develop and scale performance assessments that evolved organically in response to site-level needs. Next, we asked what conditions matter for teachers. First, we found high quality professional learning opportunities were important. In all, oh, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. In all three districts, uh, central office leaders offer professional learning focused on performance assessment, including ongoing communities of practice in Los Angeles and Oakland. These sessions were often opt-in and focused on setting expectations for student work, as well as calibrating the scoring of student work. On-site coaching was another important form of support. We also identified the importance of supporting and recognizing strong teacher leadership. Not surprisingly, we observed that teachers were the key to successful implementation at school sites across all three districts. Teachers took on many roles from content support, such as designing instructional materials, to logistics management, such as scheduling student presentations and recruiting judges. In many cases, teachers received extra planning time and compensation to recognize this work although more time and more compensation also emerged as areas of ongoing need in our study. Lastly, we asked what conditions matter for students. We found that instructional leaders, such as principals, coaches, and lead teachers, were best positioned to adapt the performance assessment to the needs of their students and school community and to ensure adequate supports for students. Students benefited from access to mentorship, peer support, time to prepare for the culminating performance assessment in class or independently, or both, and exposure to curriculum that builds relevant skills, such as writing research papers and giving presentations. As I mentioned earlier, we spoke with students and teachers at a few schools in each district, and we heard about a variety of benefits associated with their experience. Students described how they were able to demonstrate deeper learning competencies, such as critical thinking and communication. They felt greater confidence in their college and career preparation, and they experienced growth in social emotional skills, such as perseverance. Teachers shared how they were able to align curriculum instruction and assessment across subjects and grade levels, including backward mapping their instruction from the culminating defense. They also shared how they were able to continuously ref reflect on and improve their instructional practice. 
and how they were able to develop closer relationships with their students and more collaborative relationships with their fellow teachers. Across the three districts, we identified eight lessons learned along with accompanying recommendations for district leaders and state policymakers. I'm going to share a few highlights here. I'm not going to go through all eight, but I do encourage you to take a look at the research brief or the full report in order to learn about the full set of lessons and recommendations. I'll start with recommendations to support districts with implementing performance assessments, then I'll move on to recommendations to support teachers and students. First, we recommend that state policymakers consider opportunities to support innovative performance assessment initiatives in local districts. This can be achieved through educational standards, assessment and accountability approaches, and funding opportunities. Next, we recommend that district leaders enact a performance assessment policy that balances teacher innovation with a shared district-wide vision and clear paths for scaling up. This requires balancing an opt-in collaborative approach with centralized supports and eventual expectations for all students and schools to participate. To support teachers, we recommend that district leaders uh, develop an implementation strategy that includes strong support, such as staff time for planning, coordinating, and mentoring students, as well as professional learning and on-site coaching. To support students, we recommend that district leaders equitably allocate sufficient resources across academic programs, student demographic groups, including English learners and students with disabilities, and school sites to ensure that students have the support they need to successfully participate in the district performance assessment initiative. As noted earlier, this support may include access to mentorship, peer support, time to prepare, and exposure to relevant curriculum. And with that, I would like to introduce our panelists who are the real experts on the initiatives that I just described. As I provide brief introductions, you can also read more about each panelist at the link uh, that will be shared in the chat. I'd first like to welcome Young Wan Choi, Manager of Performance Assessments in Oakland. Young Wan has been a public school teacher in New York City, Providence, Rhode Island, and Oakland. During this time, she has developed expertise in project-based learning, curriculum design, and culturally relevant teaching. Currently, she leads the Oakland Unified Graduate Capstone work, as well as the district's ethnic studies program. She also produces and hosts the Young in the World podcast, and I do recommend you give that a listen. I'd also like to welcome Esther Solomon, Career Technical Education and Link Learning Administrator in Los Angeles Unified. Esther has been an educator for the past 39 years, including five years as principal of the Los Angeles High School of the Arts, which was the first pilot school and the first linked learning certified pathway in LA Unified. Currently, Esther oversees 422 career pathways, of which 78 are linked learning. Her office is focused on revising the district graduate profile, deepening performance assessments, and expanding the portfolio and defense as a means of demonstrating proficiency on the graduate profile. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome Christina Turley, College and Career Coordinator for Pasadena Unified. Christina has spent her career working in the district as an elementary school teacher, a coach, a site administrator, and now a central office administrator. Her favorite part of her job is watching her former elementary school students become ambitious, thoughtful, and focused high schoolers. Christina has a passion for personal growth and considers herself a lifelong learner, having earned both her MA from Cal State LA and her doctorate from the University of Southern California in education. So I am very excited to welcome our panelists, and I want to make sure we can see and hear Young Juan as well. So Young Juan, can you all hear me? To turn on. We can hear you. Uh, it says I can't Excellent. open it here. Okay. Well, we can we can hear you. Um, so let's jump in. You know, I I'd like to acknowledge that implementing a district performance assessment initiative is a challenging endeavor. It's not simple. It's not easy. So I'd really like to hear what drives each of you to do this work and why does it matter. And let's start with Esther. Thank you so much, Anna. At this point in my career, having started teaching in 1979, I do this work because exactly as Anna said, I am driven. 
I've taught in public, private schools, middle, high, college, on the East Coast, in the Midwest, but mostly in LA Unified. And I think the work that we're currently doing with link learning and performance assessment is the most meaningful, purposeful work we can offer our young people. This work supports students in finding their voice. It empowers them. And often our students are so self-effacing and many don't have the privilege of growing up with parents who, provide, who are professionals and who provide a sense of confidence. And the many project-based learning opportunities that Link Learning provides assist students in understanding that they do have a place in this world and that they can play an important role. I think providing a spe specific example of this will demonstrate my point. One summer, a young student was complaining that her father was constantly getting um, uh, tickets for selling food on the streets. He was a food vendor. And the faculty got together and created a performance assessment, a PBL. Um, it was a digital media pathway. So students created a, a, a video where they interviewed uh, street vendors, they interviewed legislators, uh, they edited the film. In their English class, they wrote persuasive speeches. In their government class, they learned how do you change a law? How do you advocate for a law? Um, why join a neighborhood community? Um, so they learned the importance of this, but with real application. They went to City Hall, they delivered the speech, they delivered the uh, video, and within uh, a year and a half, City Hall changed the law. So those are the kinds of performance assessments that are really meaningful for our kids. Thank you. It's really powerful to, to hear the, that story. And our, our one of, I think for our the LPI team, one of our favorite experiences is just getting to attend student presentations and really seeing the power of learning in action. Christina, what drives you to do this work? Be sure to unmute yourself. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I, it's very similar to what Esther said. It, it's um, helping students make meaning of what they're learning. So that, that application of their knowledge that they gain through, through content skills, through their CTE pathways, um, that's super important. I, you know, learning in isolation to me is not true learning. Um, if students have this knowledge and they're not able to apply it, I think that um, it's somewhat dangerous, right? We're not giving our students the, the types of skills they're going to, to need in the real world. Um, so this work is really exciting. And I think for me in particular, with students in our Pasadena public schools, um, for those of you who don't know who are around the country, um, and you know, some of you in California may not know that um, we have the highest number of private schools per capita um, for any city anywhere uh, in the U.S. So for us in the public school setting, it's super important for us to make sure our students have the skills to make them marketable, to make them viable in the world economy. And I don't want them to just be able to perform with um, the private school students that they are uh, competing against. I want them to outdo those students and to have um, skills that they can apply outside of our classroom. Awesome. And Yang Wan, I'd love to hear from you as well. All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon. It's uh, first of all, just great to be on this panel with my colleagues from Los Angeles and Pasadena, as well as from LPI. And, and most importantly, to all of you who are in the listening audience, it's just so great to be in a space with people who have the ability to make such a significant impact on the lives of students. Um, and I wanna start by um, saying what may be obvious, um, but the system is broken. Um, the system of standardized assessment, the system of competition, the system of, that's based on individualism, that's a broken system. And performance assessment um, and the work that we're all trying to do is, is an attempt to build a more humane system. It's an attempt to build a system that's based on collectivism. Um, and it's, it's an attempt to address the fact that performance or that standardized testing is really intended to, cr to create an intellectual hierarchy uh, for sorting purposes. Uh, and so just as a quick example, like hypothetically, let's just imagine that all students one year taking the SAT scored a 1600, which would be the top score, right? Would we celebrate and say, wow, we did such a great job preparing students. They all scored at the, at the top. 
No, I don't think so. I think we look around and say, well, what's wrong with the SAT? There's something broken about the test. We have to fix the questions because the way the, the standardized tests are designed is to create a bell curve of performance. And there's always going to be a subset of students that are designated to be failures when it comes to a standardized test. And that subset historically has been our black and brown students. So to me, performance assessment is a civil rights issue. It's an issue of racial justice. Uh, performance assessments I'm super passionate about because of all the reasons stated by the other panelists as well. It's an opportunity for authentic assessment of learning. It's an opportunity for growth and reflection. But ultimately for me, performance assessment is about creating a more humane system um, and, and recognizing the humanity of all of our students. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those, those words of wisdom. And um, I think that also really speaks to what I mentioned briefly earlier, which is that assessment does not just have to be a judgment of what students know. It can support instruction and student learning and also be a learning experience itself. And that's really powerful to see. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone who's submitting questions. We are going to um, put some audience questions into the conversation a bit later and just encouraging. I know we saw in the poll that there's a lot of folks in the audience who also are engaged in implementing performance assessments. So please share your thoughts and reactions as well in the chat. Um, so I crammed two years worth of research into about 15 minutes of talking on this webinar, <laughs> um, which was not easy. But we're, we really did land around the key conditions for supporting districts, students, and teachers as being some of the key takeaways. And so I'm really interested to hear, as you were listening to that presentation and as, as you've um, been our partner in, in this research, what do you see as being examples of conditions that you find to be most important or if you can share examples of the way that these conditions really look in the real world? And I'd like to um, direct the question to Christina first. Sure, for us, um, you know, the, the LPI research really served as a, as a guidepost for where we want to go next. We're always in a state of continuous improvement, so this research really gave us a, a space to uh, turn to and ideas to kind of point to. Your, your research is very narrative in nature as, we, as well as data filled, so it had a little bit of something for everyone to kind of latch on to. And using that, we, um, you know, we, we realize that we need to have a collective ownership of the work that we're doing with our senior defense. Um, as Anna described earlier, it is a graduation requirement for all of our seniors. So um, that involves all of our, our teachers, all of our um, staff at all of the sites. So that, that is something we, um, we definitely need to push forward, and that's, that's a a place that we are pushing our practice. Um, right now we have site coordinators, and if you read the research, you can read a little bit about our, our site coordinators. Um, but our site coordinators drive a lot of the work, and we at the district level drive a lot of the work that's happening. And we are pushing ourselves to make the senior defense part of the culture at the school sites and have the, the school sites kind of take ownership of the work that's happening. And um, create a culture in which students not only know they have to do a senior defense, but they're excited to do a senior defense and they know it's a celebration of their learning and they know that every staff member on their site is invested in the process with them and they are encouraging them to be reflective learners throughout high school from you know, their ninth grade year all the way to the last day of their senior year because you know, that reflection piece is, is, is pivotal for this to um, be meaningful to our students. Thanks for sharing that, Christina. And I think your point really underscores that it's helpful to have a, pol a foundational policy in place, but that's just the beginning of the work. Then it's really about looking at those key starting conditions and transferring uh, the work and partnership to the school place. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And without that, without that foundational piece, we wouldn't have been able to move forward. Excellent. Go ahead, Sure. Um, so the, the condition that I think uh, resonates most strongly with me is the one around professional learning. And within professional learning, uh, for me, it's not about an individualistic approach, um, but really a collectivist approach to how we think about 
professional learning. It's not a sit and get with an expert at the front of the room. It's really about bringing the wisdom of our teachers together so that they can problem solve. Um, and so the way that we've designed our professional learning is um, primarily in two uh, different setups. One is a summer professional learning series, which is usually uh, three to five days. And then we also have a school year professional learning, uh, which happens quarterly. Uh, but in, in either case, um, the key foundation to that is that teachers are speaking to each other from across um, different campuses that um, the primary agenda is for them to have space to, to talk and discuss and problem solve together. Um, we, we don't, we of course bring things to kind of challenge and push their thinking um, and we, and we encourage them to share practice. Um, and so some of the things that we've seen emerge from these spaces is we've created um, a resource bank of some of the best practices of our teachers over the last eight years. And that's something that every new teacher to the capstone gets as part of their kind of induction process to the capstone. Um, we also have um, a process where um, my co-facilitator and I, Cameron Frederick, will um, you know, go and observe in classrooms and spend time understanding the conditions that our teachers are teaching in, what their students need. Uh, we'll listen to them and find out what the teachers need. And then we bring something to the table and we model a lesson based on what we're seeing as some of the challenges in the classroom. Um, again, not as experts, but just as a starting place for a conversation. So if teachers are struggling with like, how do we support students to take notes in a digital context when we were all used to doing research paper on note cards. So we came up with something, we put it out to them and said, we're going to, we're going to go through this simulation. And now let's talk about what would you do? What worked about that? What didn't? Um, and give them the bulk of the time to think and adapt those ideas for their own classroom space. Um, so again, it's really, it's really about um, empowering the teachers or giving them the agency that they deserve to be able to make the instructional choices. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are going to be there with the students teaching and leading. And so uh, we, we're just trying to create a space for that collectivism. Thank you. And we, we definitely um, saw that space, that collective space that you created as we attended professional learning sessions. Nelson. Esther, I'd love to hear from you as well. I would say two important conditions. One, Young one uh, totally um, captured when he talked about the idea of having rich repositories of work. We have um, websites for portfolio and defense, and we have repositories of PBLs and exemplars. We have practitioner centers, so other pathways can go and observe at those practitioner centers. But I would say the other area, exemplars are really, really important. The other area I would identify is also in our district, it's an opt-in. Um, because as Young Wong said, the system is broken in terms of standardized assessments, but it's also broken in the way that we treat our teachers. Um, we are, they're inundated with requirements, mandates, bulletins, memos. Um, and so an opportunity for them to learn about something that they might want to become a part of is what we offer them. So we have inter information sessions that we provide for them. Um, then we go to the school sites and we talk in more detail, answer any questions they have. Then they have an opportunity to opt in if 75% of the teachers are on board in the administration because you know, we're, we're providing money, we're providing um, coaching, we're providing work-based learning instruction. And so we want people to be serious about this, but if they decide to opt in and they come to the five onboarding sessions, which are held on Saturdays, um, uh, once a month from January through May, then they can become a link learning pathway and get that kind of support with the coaching and the modeling and visiting other sites and talking to other folks and, and learning from our team. Um, so I would say those are the two big conditions. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. I think another question that we saw reflected in, in, in some of what the audience submitted in advance and also that we just hear a lot in general is how do we support consistency and quality in this work, um, both in terms, of the, in terms of the consistent scoring of work that students produce and, and the consistency of student work. Um, and so we would just love to hear how, how each of you have approached supporting consistency and quality in this work. Start with Thanks, Anna. Um, so this is a, a very important question um, because I think there is a push and, and a context that we're in uh, that values the validity, reliability of the data that uh, comes out of performance assessment. 
Um, and at the same time, I think um, it's important for us not to forget like sort of what the fundamental purpose is of looking at student work, um, which is to be able to understand, you know, what do we expect of students and are students achieving what, what it is that we, we want them to and then how do we support them to get there um, and students also to do that same reflection. So, you know, fundamentally, uh, when you're working with teachers around in the performance assessment system, you have to look at student work. You have to create time for them to discuss it, um, and you have to have a common rubric to score it. Otherwise, you're you're talking about completely different things. Um, and so, uh, in our experience in Oakland, um, you know, back in 2005 when we had our board policy, not a single school was using the same rubric for assessing our senior project. Um, and even in 2012, when I went around and I did a listening campaign in our high schools, there was still not a single high school where you know, students were using the same rubric as another high school. Um, now, as a district, it, it could be an easy answer to say, well, let's just mandate everybody to use the same rubric and then we're done with this problem. Uh, but really, um, you know, these kinds of technical fixes uh, for adapt, or these are like adaptive challenges and technical fixes don't really work. And so we really needed to bring our teachers together uh, because they were the ones who understood the nature of the problem and they were the ones who were poised to fix it. Um, but it was a critical point in that first year when we actually had a student come and give their presentation and we scored the student on a rubric um, and we had an amazing conversation about like what is it that we expect in terms of quality from our students across the district uh, and the fact that we were using the same rubric as a basis for that conversation really changed what we were able to say to one another and also what we were able to share in terms of resources and support. So it was that process that, that showed the teachers there was value in us using the same rubric. And since that moment over the last eight years, uh, we've gone from zero schools using the same rubric to 70 plus percent of our students being assessed um, on the same rubric for the capstone. Um, and that was all built through the practice that the teachers engaged in, um, and it wasn't driven by the policy. Now, that doesn't mean to say there isn't a, a place for policy. I think we, we do need the policy. Uh, but, you know, there is a question of which comes first, the practice or the policy. And in our case, we had a policy that didn't have good practice, and then we developed good practice, and now we're going to bring in a policy that hopefully will reflect the practice. So um, I think it's, it's, it's a journey, right? And you, and you start where you are, but ultimately it's about the work of the teachers to develop the practice. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's the, you've named the chicken and the egg question, I guess. <laughs> we, and we need both. Um, and I think we do have some quotes in the case studies about teachers just sharing how powerful that professional learning is for them of, of sitting down and really looking deeply at student work and talking about it with colleagues. Um, I'd like to open up space for Esther or Christina, if, if either of you would like to add thoughts around this topic. Yeah, I, I think for us, for sure, it was the consistency. In order to get the consistency, you know, what are we looking for? Are we looking for similar things? And because ours is district-wide, those common rubrics were really important to the work we were doing. Um, as Young One alluded to, that work is very hard work. Um, those rubrics were vetted um, with community groups and student groups and educators with various different partners, you know, Envision, Buck Institute. So it, it took a, a, a good while to vet rubrics that were um, deemed worthy um, with educators and students alike. You know, students had a, had a um, big say in our, in our rubrics. It's a two-point rubric because students um, advocated for that. So we definitely listened to student voice. You know, and, and you have to think about the iteration process of your rubrics if you're going to use common rubrics for all. Um, so at a certain point, you just have to go for it and use your rubrics and hold off any comments or questions and then, you know, then open that, that back up. Um, another, uh, another thing we utilize for our, our um, validity and common practice is we have a group um, that we bring together monthly. Um, in order for them to share best practices. And it's, it's our um, site coordinators at all of our school sites along with an administrator. And they're able to share best practices and bring up questions that are happening at their school sites in particular. 
And that often answers questions for others or together collectively, we're able to create a process or a document or um, someone's able to go to their site and, and put it into action and then come back and let everyone else know how it went. So that, that has been an asset to, um, to that work. I would just briefly add, so we have more time for questions, but I would just briefly add, I'd want to thank SCALE and Envision Learning Partners for helping us to validate those rubrics that we do have for our artifacts. And also to say, yes, I think it's about, in the beginning, it was just the process of like, what is link learning? How do we demonstrate link learning? How do we develop link learning? How do we help and support our pathways? So it was developing the practices first. And now we're coming to the point of like, okay, we're reaching 70 some pathways. How do we provide an example to the district and to the state that what we're doing can be validated, that what we're doing can be measured in a way that's meaningful and purposeful? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I think it's time to start addressing some questions from the audience. So we've received a lot of interesting questions and comments from you all, as I mentioned, both uh, in advance as people were registering for the webinar and also in the chat in the Q&A today. Um, so we'll probably have time just to address a few of the questions, but do keep in mind that we're going to be sharing contact information um, in the slides so that there is an opportunity to follow up if anyone has questions remaining after, after this conversation. So I think I'll start first. Uh, with the issue of the moment, um, which is how has the pandemic been impacting the work that we're discussing? And I do want to note that uh, in each of the district case studies and in the cross case report, we did add an appendix uh, giving a very brief overview of how each of the districts responded when schools shut down last spring. Um, but I would like to give the panelists a chance to address how did you adapt your performance assessment work last spring and how are you thinking about assessment, uh, assessing student learning moving forward um, this year in what is currently a distance learning context in which may be a blended learning context uh, at, at other points in the year? So I'll start with um, Christina and we can go from there. Sure, yeah, um, it, it definitely uh, brought about some like instant decisions that needed to be made. And, and like all of you, initially we thought, oh, we'll be out for two weeks. And then it turned into, you know, what it is currently. Um, so for us, we, we knew immediately that the senior defense was still a priority um, for our students. So we quickly drafted something that the board approved and our, our CAO approved, um, stating that Number one, we weren't going to uh, hold, um, we were going to hold students harmless uh, as far as any COVID related anything that, that happened in their lives. But beyond that, um, we still wanted our students to present. So we created online ways for that to happen, either with full panels. Um, at the time, we were using Google Meets. So a student can come into a Google Meet session with a full panel, receive that Q&A portion and feed, feedback in real time or if that was not feasible for the students, they could do a screencastify where they presented alongside their, their slides. Um, or they could video record. We had some students stand beside a computer and video record themselves and turn in that recording. Um, we learned a lot through that process, uh, for sure. Um, and we've decided for this year that um, we'd like all of our students to have the full panels because there's a lot that, that you miss out on when you don't have the Q&A portion of um, the defense and students aren't able to maybe defend something they didn't necessarily bring up during the presentation. And the feedback is just such an important part of the process um, that we definitely want students to experience that piece. I feel like it, it validates uh, what our students are doing and what they're what they're putting into the project. So that's how we foresee moving forward. Great. And Juan, did you want to add anything about that? Sure. Um, so, you know, it's 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 interesting because um, you know earlier talking about standardization, right? Standardization in and of itself is not always a bad thing. Right, and actually our work around building investment in a common rubric is a form of standardization across our district. 
but what's happened in this particular moment is because the needs of each of our school sites at the high school level are really different and what our students need, you know, at a newcomer high school uh, continuation, students who are older, like a lot of them are working, um, you know, jobs and so they're not able to access distance learning as much. So like a uniform um, district policy around our capstone, um, you know, hasn't been um, the direction that we've gone forward with. Uh, we are continuing to expect that everybody does it, but we're giving the sites a lot of flexibility on the way they define that. Um, so even though I think we've been moving towards like standardization around the rubrics this year, we're taking kind of a step back and saying like, okay, every school site's got to figure this out based on um, the particular needs of their school community. And we're there to guide them and support them and share what's happening in different places. Um, and that being said, like the vast majority of our schools are still going forward with the research paper um, and oral presentation and just moving everything online. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of where we are in Oakland. I would, um, we're, we're kind of in the same place. Um, every pathway is making its own decisions about this. We're encouraging them to move forward with it. We had some pathways that did do a portfolio and defense at the end of the year, some that didn't. Um, we have some, I, I think our, our link learning uh, team is working really hard to help teachers understand that they can still do PBLs easily in this situation. And, um, but there are just so many things happening across the district that we're trying to just be there to support them and, um, you know, and listen to what their needs are so we can support them. Makes sense. Um, well, let's see, I think we definitely have time for another question or two. Um, one thing that I'm seeing brought up in the chat is the questions around equity and supporting students, thinking particularly about differentiating supports for students with disabilities, English learners, others with different needs. Um, so we'd just love to hear some thoughts about what it can look like to really address equity in this performance assessment work and uh, differentiating support for students. Um, start with them. Yeah, so for us, a lot of that work has come in the form of, um, you know, trying to stay grounded in the rubrics that we're using, but talking to people who, you know, might teach in a newcomer pathway, or they might teach, um, you know, a high proportion of special needs students, um, and asking them to think about like, what kind of rubric modifications would need to be made in order for students um, to continue to demonstrate success as well as like what modifications do we need to make to the task. Um, and so this work around um, revised tasks and revised um, rubric criteria is kind of new work for us. It's in the last couple of years that we've really begun to dive into it. Um, so we do have some schools that are beginning to pilot different things. Um, and for the most part, what I'm seeing as most promising is it's, it's not about creating a whole new rubric, but it's really just about modifying the rubric you know, instead of it being, you know, that every student has to hit proficient, um, that, you know, a modification might mean that they hit proficient in some of the categories, but, you know, let's say in language use, if you're, if you're a language learner, that that might be a category where hitting approaching would be fine. Um, so, you know, making the kinds of accommodations that make sense, given, you know, what the particular learning needs are of the community you're trying to serve, while not, you know, completely diluting the experience um, or watering down this, the expectations for rigor. Go for it, I think our pathways are um, uh, adapting um, as needed, um, providing a lot of support. And what I find with the portfolio defense, it's really exciting when I go and watch students defend their work that the whole team of kids, the whole senior class is behind those kids and they're like, okay, yeah, you didn't, you didn't go, you didn't get a pass this time, but we're going to go and work with you and we're going to help you get past that. So that sense of um, students helping each other, that sense of collaboration is really beautiful to see. I would also say that um, some of our pathways have allowed students to do for our EL students to do it both in Spanish and English. Um, and that's really exciting. It, uh, you can see the grappling and the work on speaking the English portion. And then when they get to the Spanish, how fluent they are and how knowledgeable they are. And um, it's exciting to give them the opportunity and to validate that they're bilingual. So those are some of the changes that we've made or some of the support systems we've put into place or schools have done that. Yeah. And 
Christina, I'd love to hear from you if you have something to add to. I did want to flag that uh, I know we've shared a link in the chat that the California Performance Assessment Collaborative as a group actually came together and we drafted a, design, a, a guide around um, best practices for designing accessible performance assessment. So that's a great resource that we really came up with collectively. Go ahead, Christina. Yeah, and, and that resource actually um, drove us to look at our rubrics with a with an equity lens. Um, and I, I just want to say that, you know, kind of going back to what Young Wan spoke about at the beginning of of this um, panel discussion is these assessments are an opportunity for our students who don't traditionally do well on standardized tests to really show their talents. And that's what we've seen. Our um, special ed parents are like, they, had, they should get t-shirts made. They are all for this type of assessment for their students. Um, they are, are very strongly support um, this for their students. And as far as our rubrics are concerned, because we do have district wide rubrics, we have taken a look at the rubrics with our um, special ed English teachers. And they've given input on um, Really, we opened it up and asked them if they wanted to create their own rubric and modify it. And they said no, that the targets they expect their students to hit and they will get them there. So that was a really empowering conversation. And like Esther mentioned, you know, those um, are students in certain subgroups, like they are cheerleaders for one another and they have probably a better understanding of what this, uh, of the meaning of these performance assessments than our students in, in traditional um, classes. So it's it's exciting work to do for students who may not be able to represent their talents in other ways. I would just add one quick thing to that, which is um, we did similar kind of outreach to some of our special um, special needs teachers, and they uh, looked at our rubrics and also said, like, you know, our students can meet this, but you know, we need to change the language in these rubrics so that um, they don't start from deficit at the beginning and then proficiency in advanced. And so actually the way the feedback they gave us changed the way that we, the way the language of the rubric is written for all students um, so that, you know, students can see, like even if they're in the, you know, you know at the very beginning of, of, you know, their process, they're still doing something, right? So the language reflects that they're doing something, not that they're missing something. And then, they're doing a little bit more as they approach and then they're and then they're meeting and then they're exceeding right so um, that actually was some some um, feedback that we got from engaging with our special needs teachers um, and it actually impacted the way that we assess all students in our system. Definitely. Um, I think we have time for, for one more question and I do want to share that there are some really I think very powerful vignettes in the research reports where we actually describe what we saw as researchers um, seeing students present their work. And there's also an element of cultural responsiveness in a lot of this work as well that I think is another facet of this conversation around equity that students are, and what we heard in the student focus groups too, is that students are being invited to bring their whole selves into the classroom um, with this work to address issues that are important to them and to share elements of their, what's important in their lives. Um, so I really encourage folks to, to also check out the, the, the stories, which we heard Esther share at the beginning, but we can never fully capture that. Um, we also do have some videos on the Learning Policy Institute website showing Oakland students presenting their work. And I think those are from maybe 2017, 2018. So they're, they're a couple of years old, but they're still really relevant. Um, and I'm sure we shared those links earlier, but maybe we can share those again in the chat um, just to see what what is happening in, in action. So I guess my closing question would be, one, one minute to each of the panelists, what advice would you have for other educators, particularly district leaders, who want to do this type of assessment work? And I'll start with Esther. Thanks, Anna. So I would say, bringing stakeholders together. Um, we're in the middle of revising our graduate profile right now, and it's been really exciting to hear from industry and parents and students and um, uh, administrators and teachers um, about thinking about what is it we want students to know? What skills should they have? What attributes should they have um, in order to demonstrate that they're ready to graduate? 
So I think that that's really exciting. Um, the other thing I would say is when you start up something really different like this, um, because it is a huge shift for our teachers to make in terms of instruction, that you provide opportunities for them um, that you, you understand they need time to do this. So you set aside time for them to work together. You set aside time. You say this is important. You're not just giving them a once a week, 15 minute meeting time, but that you really are devoting time and quality uh, opportunities for them to come together. And that you're also providing um, exemplars. I think that's so important. Uh, when we went up to see Envision Learning Partners for their graduate uh, defense and, and portfolio, it was, um, we took 12 people and they were all, it was like, okay, you don't have to tell us anymore, we want to do this. So seeing is really so much more important than just hearing about it. So we've, you know, we've developed videos, we've developed repositories, we've developed practitioner centers. All of those are really important um, ways in which um, you can bring people on board to want to make these kinds of changes. Because I think most people really understand that this is very different and they want to do something like this instead of the typical work. Thank you. Uh, one minute from Christina. Sure, I would just echo what Esther said. Seeing is believing. Um, we took a group of, of teachers, practitioners to, to see some Envision um, portfolio defenses. And then we created our own mini uh, defenses. We grabbed a few students and from all um, areas in, uh, of learning, and we had a roadshow of students that we would take from site to site. So the idea that our students can do it was valued when the presentations happened. All right, young mom, close it out, please. I would echo some of, of what's been said here and, and say that, you know, if you're working in a district context, look for your existing practice. Where is this already happening? Where are people already pushing the envelope? Where are they already creating the kinds of things that you're excited about that, that you can highlight internally? Because I, I do think to Christina's point, um, there's sometimes skepticism about what happens outside of a district, at least in Oakland, it's always like, well, that, that, ha that can't happen here. Um, so the fact that it is happening here um, and happening in some of our most challenging contexts was part of the, the big sell for teachers to see like, oh, wow, this, this really can happen here in Oakland. Um, and then the other thing is just to really, you know, get back, getting back to sort of my initial um, points here, it's, it's really about the purpose, like what is the deep, meaningful purpose behind why we do this work? Um, and that isn't necessarily a top-down vision, but that has to be a collective vision, it has to come from listening to the teachers, it has to come from, from the bottom, so to speak, um, of you know, where people are closest to the students, what, what do they see as the value of this kind of system, um, and really being, and leading with that vision, leading with that sense of purpose, um, a, a purpose of being, um, <clears throat> you know, a civil rights issue, a purpose of being about racial justice, a purpose of, about you know, growth mindset, a purpose of, of really changing the way that we think about students um, and addressing um, so many of the challenges, I think, that dehumanize young people in schools. Thank you for those great closing words, and thank you to all of our panelists. This was a great discussion today. We've learned so much from you um, in the course of, of our work together. So if you are a California educator who's interested in joining CPAC, um, Feel free to reach out. I know we have a link that we're going to share in the chat uh, that you can get you on the mailing list. So we have a mailing address. Um, for everyone on the webinar today, we invite you to dig into the research, reach out to the LPI team if you have any questions. District leaders, you may want to start out by looking at the key conditions in the report and thinking about what conditions you already have in place and where what you might want to start working towards. Um, and we also do have wonderful resources available from all of our partners as well, um, which we were, are sharing out both in the chat and we also will send us a follow-up email along with a recording of the webinar today. So I'd just like to say that as you're closing out, you're gonna see a survey pop up uh, as you leave the webinar and we would really appreciate your feedback. Thank you everyone, have a wonderful day.